So I'd like to welcome Kevin Flanagan. Kevin is a partner at PLP Architecture and an architect with 30 years of experience establishing a reputation for award-winning design through major world-class cities. His design solutions resolve both city and context in the environmental concerns in a single bold concept. His designs are a response to the nature of place. Among other projects, Kevin is currently working on PLP's Timber Tower proposal a research project together with the University of Cambridge. The feasibility proposals imagine the future development of laminated timber tall buildings in central London, adding an 80-story, 300-meter tower and additional levels of housing to the Barbican complex. So please welcome Kevin Flanagan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll just start off here. Um, I'm going to be talking about two aspects. The first, I'm going to be speaking about one of the projects. I've got models here called The Edge in Amsterdam. It uh, last year won the world's uh, most sustainable project, uh, according to Briam, which is uh, comparable, a little bit better actually than LEED. And, um, I also wanted to mention that it's very wonderful to be here. C'est très bon d'être invité, and I hope everyone can speak French because the rest of the talk will be in French. And <laughs> now I have been around for a while, and I was grew up in Montreal, and of course my experience of architecture and design really had to do with pavilions and looking to the future. How disappointed I was 10 years later, you know, finding out that most of the buildings of the world were not quite as wonderful as these. Um, but certainly Canada has inspired a lot of uh, my design work, and you can see the wonderful painting here by Lauren Harris, and that's uh, imitated in some ways by the tower that's in The Hague that won an International High Rise Award. And I also worked uh, with James Wines on the Expo 86 Highway Pavilion, which was in Vancouver. So Canada has been a significant part of my, my uh, career in architecture. This is our office. We have about 200 people. It's in Tower Hill. We have an open office in the sense that you can come and visit anytime you want. We're happy to show you things and show our model shop and discuss architecture generally. Now, we're known not just in Europe, but internationally for one project, uh, notably the Edge, which is models here. And if you have time, or even now, you can come up and just have a browse and look at them. It's, it's uh, good to stand up and walk around a little bit if you're wanting. Um, so here is the project as it is. There's an animation involved as well. But basically what this does is re-envision how the office is intended to work. The client, uh, which was OVG, a quite a, a forward-seeking uh, developer, was wanting a new type of building that they could eventually sell and also to become a headquarters uh, to uh, Deloitte. But what's interesting after it was completed was that they monitored, they have about 30,000 monitors through the building so they could really understand how people use the building. And what became evident to them was that people were using the building not in a traditional way as expected. That young people today, because they have, let me show you the wonderful Mr. Mr. iPhone, basically computer in your pocket, that people network in a completely different way and in fact people have been taught through schooling to work together in a way that was unconventional at my at the time that I was going to school so people congregate in these social spaces that we've created in a way that's uh, phenomenal and people don't want to work necessarily at Deloitte but they want to work in the building which is something you should think about because it changes what we do Welcome to the Edge. This is certifiably the greenest office building in the world. But that just might be part about it, because the Edge in Amsterdam is also possibly the most connected office space in the world. Working at the Edge is insane. It all starts with a smartphone app developed by the building's main tenant, the consulting firm Deloitte. When you arrive at the edge, a camera recognizes you by your license plate for automatic access. And because it's the Netherlands, there are chargers available for electric cars. Inside, things start to get interesting because you don't have a desk. No one here does. Workspaces are assigned to you based on your schedule for the day. 
you have options. A work booth, a meeting room, what they call a concentration room, a sitting desk, a standing desk, a balcony desk. You can even just hang out in the sun-filled atrium all day. This concept is called hot desking, and it's what allows Deloitte to have 2,500 workers, but less than half as many desks at its Dutch headquarters. The app knows your preferences, and when you arrive at your workspace, the lights dim or brighten based on your stored settings. And any of the building's massive flat screens can be instantly paired with an iPhone or a laptop. So what makes all this possible? The LED light panels developed by Philips specifically for the edge are actually powered by low voltage ethernet cables, which means every light in the building becomes its own internet connected data hub with 28,000 sensors that makes the building and its users smarter. The building becomes a very important part of who we are and what we want to be, and we actually seen in recruitment that more people are now spontaneously coming to Deloitte because they want to work in this building. Oh yeah, and then there's these. The building has solar on the roof and on the south-facing wall, enough to power the building and all of the electric cars, computers, and smartphones used by its employees. And those employees are kept warm by two enormous boreholes tunneling more than 400 feet down beneath the building. During the summer, the edge pumps warm water deep into the aquifer, where it sits insulated until it can be sucked back out in the winter to warm the building. Outside, there are beehive towers and bat homes to support the local pollinators. And even the rainwater is collected to flush the toilets and irrigate the gardens. We uh, are planning to build a lot more buildings like these. And the next one will be smarter, and the one after that will be smarter as well. And we won't stop until all cities in the world are filled with buildings that are intelligent and that are not using any energy anymore. In the end, we will actually need less buildings in the world, but the buildings that are there will be used in a better way, will be more efficient, and will be, uh, will be using a lot less energy than in the past. Sometimes the edge just feels like it's showing off, and some of the app functionality isn't quite ready for prime time yet. But most of the time, this is all running seamlessly in the background. It's maybe the most fully realized vision of the Internet of Things the world has ever seen. Another day at the edge comes to an end. A custom security robot that looks a bit like R2-D2 wakes up and begins its patrols. Now, if only the app could automatically come conjure up a nice dinner recipe, maybe provide all the fresh ingredients at the end of the day to get you cooking. No surprise, the edge has that too. Bon appétit. Okay, so what this really is, is, is looking at a building as a social space. And of course, there are a lot of the features that are mentioned that provided us the, enough of the uh, profile to gain uh, a wonderful uh, accounting by uh, Briam. But one of the things that's really important for architects is the fact that we're really trying to find new ways to provide spaces that enervate young people to work in the building and really increase productivity in a sense because people who are happier work more collectively, more uh, uh, collegially. And a lot of the things that we're discussing have a lot to do with how we see ourselves and the building form. Um, very often, uh, and even today, people think of buildings as static objects, but what if we thought of the buildings as things that produce energy, that create new ideas, that try to promote the uh, sharing of ideas through the building. And that's really the idea of the plan form as we have it. Deloitte and the other uh, companies that are in the building um, spend a lot of time on the road. So face time within the building is very critical for them to create a sense of community and uh, spirit. And so when we looked at also at all the registers for Briam, they were quite extensive and we've hit all those goals and uh, uh, made quite a success of them. The developer and industry and Deloitte were very proactive in trying to move the building technology forward to their advantage because if they thought if they could create a building as a showcase for this type of technology, they could export that technology to others and become uh, consultants for this type of new building. 
Now, OVG is quite bright, so they've taken this notion where this building actually produces more energy than it uses, and are thinking of building a village where the energy that's created for themselves could be shared with other buildings of different uses. You probably know hotel rooms need heating and, and office buildings need cooling. So if you can create a mixed use development of sorts and also phases of time change between uses and different types of uses. So it's an interesting project. The, the plan form was really developed as of right. This is the plan form that's created by virtue of the fact that it's going to the limit of the site. When we looked at the form at 18 meter bars, which is the span, the clear span that was possible with precast panels and flat floors, uh, we noticed some dark areas and those are the cores, as you'd expect. But for me, it's a bit like an open hand, that it's something that's opening to the sunlight. There's north light, but also from that vantage point, there are views of the highway, the trams and trains that are moving, the airport's just a little bit off to the, to the left, but also you see old Amsterdam as well off into the distance. So it's quite a glorious uh, positioning. And there's the, the green space in the center. And the slides have all gone weird. Great. And there's that central space again. These are views of it you've just seen very well. The notion that the phone is dr driving a lot of this new technology as well and therefore can be monitored. Now every person in the building voted to allow this type of information to be made available. And really it means that some of the building floors are actually closed down at certain times of the, of the day or during a whole day. On Fridays in Holland, half the day is a work day. So a lot of the building actually is vacated, a lot of the floors. And also that means for a tenant, um, uh, they don't use the floor and therefore don't, they, they don't require cleaning and that sort of thing. So that's an advantage in monitoring for the client. It won the Urban Land Institute Award. This is just, I'm putting these out just to show that we're in the media. And uh, all the other awards that we've won, AIA awards and Brian, et cetera, et cetera. Now the second building I'm going to go through really quickly. This is under development. And it's the first well building registered in, in London, which is uh, interesting because a well is not uh, necessarily something that's um, promoted. But for us, what's interesting is that it's the notion that the building uh, has components that could be made to work together in an integrated way and promote the notion of interaction between people. One of the disadvantages of having a phone is that you tend to live in a silo. And to be able to bring people together and exchange ideas really is fundamental to the way that London used to work. London had wonderful cafes. And in those cafes, the people who had been out to sea would be able to exchange ideas of where the marketplaces were and that sort of thing. That idea of being able to make an exchange of ideas and move technology forward is something that's really fundamental to this notion. And here's the ground level with a lot of amenity floors as well on the lower levels for food. The next thing is sort of future-proofing uh, uh, towers and transport. The notion is that the building itself is integrated fully into a, a very large transport exchange. I don't think you have any of these in Canada. I think in Montreal, they're probably somewhere. You have uh, high-speed trains linking to uh, 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 local trains and express route trains, all in one particular position. Now, what happens if all those people could be fed vertically into a tower? And that was the notion here. And we're continuing to study this notion here. And this was in China as a proposal. It's not meant to be a building. All it's meant to be is to illustrate a racetrack and the notion that the building form could be generated from the movement of the individual pods that circle the building. These are about the size of a, a bus, a small bus. And you can see this again as an illustration. And that won an award very recently as well for transportation. Now, most recently, we're looking at something called CarTube. And this is where it may be of interest to Toronto. Of course, I used to live here. But coming back 25, 30 years later, I'm sort of thinking, well, what has gone on in Toronto? What are the, the high points and low points? And what could we, as architects and designers and urban planners, um, think of as uh, solutions to problems that are at hand? And one of the things I found, of course, is that Toronto, to Torontonians spend a lot of time in transit. Phenomenal amount of time. So how could we make that better? And how could we make the city better? For us, we see the world as moving towards cities. So how can we make cities better, city people's lives better? 
And this notion is to take um, uh, the new technology of autonomous vehicles and try to optimize it and allow platooning of the cars. So in other words, instead of having a six-lane 401 highway, why don't we just take all of the cars that can and, and put them in one straight string of pearls and allow them to move together? You could increase speeds, increase safety, and this is possible with new technology. One of the great things to know is that in Japan, particularly, they have a culture where they, they go and walk through parks. And they've developed parks really for perambulating. It allows people the chance they, they realize to think. And uh, even in ancient literature, you'll hear of somebody saying, oh, well, I really the place that I really do all of my thinking is walking in the park. And parkland has a phenomenal impact on people's uh, sense of, of uh, self and uh, socialization, and uh, the notion here is that we create very narrow boreholes through uh, the underground uh, at about three or four meters, and at this diameter, a very small diameter, they're, ex they're exceptionally cross, uh, cost effective because the loading is so much less and the hydrostatic pressures are so much less. And with autonomous cars, there isn't a, a de uh, concern about the exhaust and things. So here's Paris as an example, London as an example. Again, this is an illustration of how CarTube would work. Only cars that have this autonomous uh, ability would be uh, made to work. A lot of the cities of the world are grids, and what we're really talking about is networking these cities so that you can go from position A to position B through the most optimal uh, route possible for your destination. Now, in New York, central, central um, Times Square could be like this, but in Toronto, oddly enough, why is it not looking like this? Is there any reason? Somebody could tell me why. Now, when we look at Toronto, I used to live here, of course, and I know a lot about the, the way that the city had grown and, and how the major railways had given a distinct flavor to the patterning of the city. Everything moves and is a move from east to west in, 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 along the coastline the shoreline, but what is also interesting is that some of these highways that were built years ago are still in existence and they physically break the, the, the ability of people who live in the city to get to the shoreline and it's somewhat of a disadvantage. In most European cities and even in Boston, they've recently dug quite large tunnels, but using, of course, old technology and old ideas of where cars go and what type of cars they really are. If we can use electric cars, then it's very, it's very possible to make something like this work. You probably know um, of examples in New York where even uh, highways have been um, turned into gardens. But the notion in Toronto would be that potentially you could reclaim that shoreline for the general public and create places for breathing and relaxation, which are essential to cities. This is another project. We've just won a Best Building Award. Here we're using timber. So, and this is the largest use of CLT timber um, in uh, the UK and one of the largest in Europe. So now I'm going to go on to timber projects particularly, and I hope I've got enough time. Globally, um, buildings are responsible about 30%. It varies depending on the parameters that you use. Interestingly, some developers are very much uh, keen on trying to meet the Paris Accords. and. Uh, 
One of them is a land lease. In Europe, just to show you what's happening there, is that, of course, there are immediate concerns that they have in London. There's a Thames barrier, and it's really been used much now, is used much more so than was ever intended. About 90% of the world's wind is, is created in, in, uh, in Europe, wind energy. And one of the things that's also interesting, in Paris, people perambulate quite a bit, walking in cities, that sort of thing, and there's a notion of trying to make the walking uh, surfaces uh, potentially solar gain, or also I've even seen energy created through pressure pads very recently. But automation is something that's keenly being developed in Europe, and, um, and uh, that leads on to our project, the Timber Tower. In North America, very different in the, in the way that people have uh, uh, used cities. Um, they were at uh, in the beginning of uh, Canada's history, about 80% uh, of the people actually lived in the countries, only 20% of the cities, because they were central trading hubs. Um, as we move now to our century, we're finding just the reverse, and this is true over all of North America, that the, there's a centralization, compaction that's happening within city cores. So where did all the people go? Well, they came to cities. And where are all the people going to be in the next, uh, next uh, so many years, 40 years? The population is going to double in major urban cities you know, throughout the world, in about 150 large cities of the world. You're going to have a, a huge amount of congestion. And the, the notion of creating livable cities is going to become the most important, because if people do not feel um, uh, at ease in the cities that they live and feel that they, they will move. And in some cases, cities in, in, in the Far East are actually planning to move themselves. Cities of five million, they're planning to build alternative cities because of the difficulties that they have in uh, sort of retrofitting the older cities. Um, population growth is always an issue, and every by the time we finish this talk, there'll be 200 new people added to the planet. So in 40, 45 minutes. And of course, we've reached that threshold where half the population live in cities. And uh, so much of the pollution is created by humans. But also, as we collectively increase as a, as a, as a species on the planet, what will tend to happen is our CO2 profile will increase globally. And so we're talking about saving CO2. In fact, what we, we should also be discussing is how we can create negative CO2, how we can sequester the CO2, and that probably is going to be a, a, a part of the issue of using this timber. Uh, presently, there are about 7.5 billion people in the, in the world, um, and uh, uh, in 2050, there'll be about, uh, five, about 7 uh, million living in cities proper. So what's really critical, I'm going to see whether I can actually get this thing to work, because they gave me this, this little cigar. Let's see. Oh. Not working. In any case, what I'm really talking about is the negative, the yellow zone. And that's where these timber towers can really have a, an application because they can drive down the CO2, quite importantly. So we have basically two tracks. We are, and these, this is information that's gleaned from the World um, Economic Forum and others. Um, the track one is do nothing. And that would lead us on to a, a significant increase in our CO2 footprint over time, and then the other one is to do something and uh, try to create a more sustainable world. So again, in terms of uh, housing and residential, we need double the capacity to what we have presently. And why engineered timber? Well, one of the things is it lose, uses less waste compared to other materials. Now, if we look at Toronto, we can see that concrete here is used primarily as the material of choice. Uh, for whatever reason, when we compare that to a place like New York, as an example, it's double the percentage. And uh, here as well, residential is more than 50% of the total uh, use. So we have residential and we have high use of concrete. Well, how could we make a change to that? And why are, why are other materials not also being investigated? In terms of negative embodied carbon, uh, steel, concrete, because they use a huge amount of energy to, to process them. And all of these things, other than timber, are really um, extracted from the soil and can't be uh, renewed or reused so easily. Steel, a little less, uh, less uh, difficult, but still using a lot of processing energy. While as timber, oddly enough, is virtually zero or 
um, negative because it's sequestering the CO2. In fact, the energy for producing a, a, a piece of wood from the forest to uh, your table, 90% um, of the energy is actually in the drying process of the, of the timber and seasoning it. So if we could make some other methodology that would allow for the, um, for the drawing of the timber, then you would be very far down the chain in terms of energy use. Timber, this type of material, is very, very strong by weight. And you can sort of see by graph it's equal, comparable to a steel, stronger by weight than concrete. Concrete just happens to be quite heavy by comparison. So it's light and strong. And in urban settings, what's been found is that we would need in Europe and in London, as an example, about uh, five to 10 deliveries um, in concrete versus one delivery by timber and pre-assembled panels. So wood is a good thing for cities. People have a great response to it. Frank Lloyd Wright thought it was the best friend. <laughs> So now we go on to this project particularly, where we were working with Cambridge University to look at the potential use of the material. And what they constantly are saying really is that this is renewable material. When they study timber, they're also looking at bamboo and other uh, sustainable uh, growing uh, living materials that then can be um, brought forward. Um, in Canada, of course, there's a lot of timber, and this is the case in, in, in Europe. In Europe, in Sweden, about 20% of the GDP is, is uh, driven by their forestry products. And what they found is that there's been very recently a, a significant, uh, I won't call it a collapse, but a reduction. So they're looking uh, of the use of their managed forests. So they have material that's growing. So they have sort of a stockpile of material and they have no place to use it. Um, their building codes are, uh, are sort of rudimentary. This is an engineered timber, so it's not wood, but the classification needs to be made that allows this material to be used uh, more effectively and brought more broadly. In Canada, what has happened very likely in a similar scenario is that pulp and paper mills and that sort of thing have, have um, uh, run into financial difficulties, partly because people don't read newspapers quite as much, and everybody's got tablets. So these primary uses of, of the past are no longer uh, markets for uh, this material, and that's true in Europe. And so this CLT offers the potential of allowing for a greater number of houses and residentials to be built quickly, easily, economically, and uh, gives a, a new impetus to an industry that's uh, somewhat in decline. Um, so this is, the, this is the quote from a, a recent magazine about the wonderful, spectacular timber tower. We were invited by Cambridge University because we have experience in tower design. Uh, we are doing about three towers in London uh, to date. And this was our team, University of Cambridge, Smith & Walwork, who have a 15-year experience with this type of material. And we're part of a larger package of, of architects that Cambridge have brought together. Um, to look at this material for high-rise development. The design of this first Oakwood timber tower in London was really based on the notion of quadrants and um, very similar to the Sears Tower. And again, it's the tallest building proposed in London if it were to be built. But Cambridge are also working with uh, architects in, in Chicago and engineers elsewhere to design other types of buildings very similarly. So you can look up these timber towers and see that this is something that's being progressed um, with aid of industry. And the notion really is to test the materials, build mock-ups, and uh, get a better understanding in terms of uh, the strength and uh, use. One of the wonderful things about timber is that people really, really like the material, apparently, for children who have learning disabilities. If they're placed in schools, school rooms with timber surrounds, if also they can look out to green space, then they do better, uh, they perform better in tests, they're a little bit more sociable. Apparently, our relation to wood is very a powerful one. When we look at a piece of with timber or live in these types of environments, our uh, heart rate goes down, and it's thought that we become a little bit more sociable, and uh, there are other sorts of benefits. Apparently, in hospitals, when they have hospitals with timber walls and timber floors and timber ceilings, uh, people, um, are, it promotes promotes healing. That's a, a case in point that was mentioned in a recent um, um, 
Hello. <laughs> so what we're saying with this first timber tower is that it would take about 120 minutes, about two hours, to grow the material, all the material from renewable forests in Europe. So the material's there, it's growing fast enough. And what we really find, which is interesting, I'll take the model, <laughs> is that the tower itself represents 10,000 lifetimes of sequestering of the type of CO2 that would be norm normally accumulated uh, in, in, in the atmosphere. So when you think of it, instead of creating CO2 through, the, through industry, through harvesting, you can reduce the CO2 footprint and actually go negative. And so the material is interesting. It's somewhat well suited for residential construction as well because the spans are less. But really the interesting part is that it's not part of the same type of industry. It would really require a new type of industry, a new retooling, new type of contractors. And again, the notion is that the material is a natural material, but when you take it as, uh, and cross-laminate it, you get something with a totally different properties. It has better uh, fire resistance, much greater strength, much more dependable in terms of calculation. You have probably all flown on planes recently that have carbon fiber that's used in the wings. And carbon fiber is a very thin filament, very strong in its length, but very weak in its, in its, its width. So what they do, they take those filaments and they weave them together by, they don't weave them, they, they place them together and laminate them together in a cross, uh, cross-directional fashion. And that improves their strength. In a sense, the strength that goes with its length is, is brought to bear for the material. So in a very similar way, this cross-laminated timber is a new technology that has a lot of, uh, uh, is gaining a lot of interest in Europe, particularly, particularly for housing. Um, but for architects, what's wonderful is that we really need to develop, therefore, a new language of, of architecture that responds to the strengths of the material and what is goodness for that material. One of the things that's interesting, of course, is that you look at art and realize that artists understand the material quite well when it's well studied. This is a wonderful exhibition that just happened a few years ago in Toronto. Wonderful artist. So this is this, the notion really is that architects, let's try to use this material in a new way. In Canada, there's enough material um, to house a billion people, according to Cambridge University. And this is the state of the art as it is, a wonderful project called Tret in Bergen, which was a prototype for us, and we've been speaking with them. This is 15 stories, and they're about to double that height using the similar technology, similar concept of a, of a, a, a bridge structure that's rising vertically instead of, instead of bridging horizontally, and then component parts that are fed into the, the structure. Our site was uh, outside of the limits of high-rise design, uh, which are which based on the, the Dome of St. Paul's and London Planning Code, and we're sitting within a courtyard of that, uh, of that uh, towered uh, development that was built after the war. It was designed in the uh, 1970s and only completed in the 1980s, and it's uh, precast and cast in place um, concrete within courtyards. And so we chose, because it was public housing initially, we thought that we would try to improve this notion of public housing in the center city and see what it would mean in a congested site. So we've also been speaking with Buig, who are a contractor, how to create the logistics for building the building. And the notion is not simply to build a tall tower, but also to build on top of the pre-existing uh, concrete low bar buildings. And if you ever go to Paris, you'll see exactly this happening. They are now building a top of pre-existing buildings, and it has to do with the code in Europe. When you have a, a building, a new building, and build the foundations, you can only count 50% of the loading because there hasn't been sufficient compaction occurred. But after 10 years, you could recalculate for 100% of loading. So in other words, in a very vague way, you could build again another building on top of the pre-existing building because of the, the soil conditions were allowing for greater loading, double the loading. 
And this is what's happening in Europe, in, in London as well. People are starting to realize they can build high if they can build light. And so this is a perfect example of where you can create greater density in cities um, without a significant impact to existing structures. Or you can build new structures. So the affinity of the site, and I'm mentioning this because I'm an architect, you may not be interested, but I associated very strongly St. Paul's. So the notion was that the four piers the, of St. Paul's are really used as a prototype for the four piers that support the spire of the timber tower. And the plan form has got four outer, outer piers and a central rising spire through the height. And I'll go through this really quickly. These are studies of the, the loading. And in terms of dead loading, we're working with something at the base that's about two and a half meters by two and a half meters in cross laminated timber and, and laminated timber as well. And uh, it's going to be made of four quadrants. I'll show you a video in a second. But there, Cambridge is still testing members of comparable size to be able to understand what the loading factors would be and how resilient the, the members are to sizes. Members that size aren't impossible. And there are bridge constructions that have been done of that size. So in Europe, at least, it's something that's possible. Here's the testing that's ongoing, just to show that there's a reality to this. And these are very recently, only about a month ago, these are large members that are testing to the limit of what's possible for the uh, testing gear. They resize the members so that they could understand them. And that's 650 tons of a load being borne on that member. So I'll just go through this quickly. There's a video right at the end. Here's the, here are the images. beat Scovia. Um, okay, so then the next is at Oakwood Timber Tower 2. I'll go through this very quickly. The notion really, we got a call from one of the clients because this was published in the newspaper Wednesday. We had met the mayor of London, now Boris, uh, who was Boris Johnson. He was born in the States and he remembered playing Lincoln Logs with his sister. His sister kept knocking the logs off and he kept building and building. So he really got the notion that these were pre-assembled elements that could be stacked and manipulated to different form. And the notion also that the material was coming from nature. And uh, so he was quite impressed by the whole notion and then we got reported and it, the news went to a front page of a, a Dutch magazine and one of our clients phoned us up and said, we want one of these. So he gave us a site that was the fifth site of a large development in the Netherlands, very narrow site. So it was a real problem because for architects in urban settings, you very rarely get the ideal site. This was perfectly square, so that was made it easy. This was only uh, was going to be much more complex. So the notion really is that it's a tree, it's got a central core. And what I was intending to do is to use straight members of, of of uh, timber that therefore the loading could be made much more appropriate and uh, of course they're not quite so straight as they go around the corner because the site's quite small. 
but um, in any case, we've got a basket weave as a notion, which work quite well. And these are quite the beautiful images that we've got out of it. And I've got the models here as well. And there's a video. What's interesting about that externally braced system is it also provides shade if it's oriented properly. So we have an external form that's providing the bracing, but also the shading for the inner lights of the, of the, of the tower. Um, so on the... On your left is an image of our project, and on our right is just a flavor of images from uh, Trett, Bergen, and other, other projects as well. This is an upper sky uh, um, uh, garden uh, bar, sky bar, that the client was very adamant to have because he wanted to integrate this notion of the building into, into the city. I think that was a video. Can you push that? So again, the advantage is that the material is very light, it's made of components, it can be brought to site quite quickly, it would probably take about a quarter of the time of, as it would to uh, building in other methods potentially. Um, one of the things that also happened was we were discussing uh, with Buig, this this version of Oakwood Timber Tower, was that they mentioned that we could really do this through robotics, that we could create a staged plant within the building. You could see that the exterior actually is a bracing that works as a scaffold. And that scaffolding could be used to ratchet up a, a three-story uh, factory. So very raw material could be brought to site and, and uh, create uh, the panels that are required and, and under very specialized conditions. So that's quite an interesting notion. In effect, the building would build itself uh, with a ver this very light material. So when we discussed with the Swedish government, we proposed that they engage a university in Gothenburg, which is Chalmers University, create a, a PhD program where just this type of innovation in trying to intermesh uh, digital technology, cutting and production, and the study of glues and other factors with uh, this notion of how to promote the use of this product. And it's called Digital Wood, and there are PhD students that are meant to be engaged if we could only find funding from the, from the Swedish government at the moment, but we're definitely going to go back to them and say, this was your idea, please uh, help to promote this uh, new material. And I hope in Canada the same will happen because the industry here, as far as I understand, is a little bit more abundant, and you do have a demand for housing, and it will increase because the size of Toronto, of course, is ever increasing. One of the wonderful things about the project is media. I'm just about to finish, and we've been, you know, gained accolades. This was a, a wonderful award to win, and it was an award not just for timber towers, not for steel or concrete. It was for the design of any tower in the world. So to get that kind of recognition globally was quite wonderful. We also received the group of us, including Cambridge University and Smith and Walwork, the. Uh, President's uh, Award for Research. We weren't just shortlisted, we actually won. So I'm going to have to talk to the guy who made that slide, which was me. 
Um, so that's it. If there are any questions, I've got models up here. The most wonderful thing to do with this type of material is to come up and actually touch the, touch the thing so you can understand the weight and the sensibility of it. It's quite different type of material than uh, steel and concrete. Thank you. Been told that I was on time, which is impossible. This is awesome. This is an MC's dream is to have your speaker finish a couple of minutes early. So based on that, we have about five minutes for questions and uh, um, you have the opportunity here to um, meet a great Canadian talent who's, uh, who's uh, uh, changing things around the world. So do we have any, uh, have any questions for Kevin? Lots of pictures. So. Uh, we have one right over here. Um, hi. Um, so I'm a student at University of Toronto. My name is Wen. And thanks for the very inspiring talk um, about the innovations that are leading us to the future. I have a question for you um, that come, kind of came in three parts. So, <laughs> and so um, I'm wondering how um, you see the buildings are going into the future, say 10 years from now. Is it a, a leading trend that we're going to be less reliant um, on the grid? And what technology would enable us to get there and um, the last part of the question what do you are there any interesting ideas around that um, what do we do with the existing old buildings that are um, the remaining 90% of the building stock okay so when you're mentioning the grid what are you referring to urban grid or you're referring to yeah, like electrical, electrical grid, grid or uh, the so supporting infrastructure perfect okay. okay so the fellow at OVG did a wonderful wonderful um, uh, YouTube and uh, he described how he was influenced by Donald Trump to begin but then Al Gore because Al Gore came to me and said well what type of industry are you in well I'm in development and he said and I don't think I can be very helpful he said no that's not true 40 percent of the energy that's used is buildings you know and this is going to be the wave of the future and I really do think that's correct what the fellow at OVG is talking about is building many buildings in a collection. The, the edge apparently produces more energy than it uses. So it's a factory. It is something that is actually collecting solar and, and it's got such a wonderful envelope and the, the large atrium is actually a large trombe. It's basically collecting energy and, and balancing the, the amount of energy gaining and lost through the day. That, uh, we're living in a time where this type of technology isn't new. It's not the future, it's now. So what he is doing is saying, well, let's build a few of them, let's connect them. Now, there's researchers, a fellow that I know, that I've recently met in uh, Kingston University, and what he's looking at is storage. If the storage of electricity can be, it's, it can be transformed, to what uh, something other, and also I think transmission, because so much energy is lost in transmission, um, the world will change very fundamentally. And you have to understand, think of, oh God, I've lived a long time, so a lot of the companies that I would have known, you've never heard of. Because every 20, 10, 20 years, it happens in our industry, every seven years, there's a total changing of the guard the industry leaders are those who take up technologies like this today and are aware that they exist. And uh, to, as professionals, really, you have some obligation to know what is going on in the world around you. And this is why it's wonderful for me to speak. I know something of it, of one sector of it. Um, what was your second question? <laughs> um, what do we do with the, the old buildings? What do you want to do with them? Well, you're, you're building all those really wonderful new buildings that are innovative, but the, all the old buildings that make up the most of the building stock and they consume the most energy, what do we do with them? What, what do you think we should do with them? <laughs> there are some building designs that were really of their time. Um, I was thinking of building, if, have you ever driven a car from the 1950s? Well, the problem with them is that there's no seat belts and they had a, a driving column at the steering wheel that if there was a sudden, uh, a, a sudden impact, the, the, dry, the, the steering column would kill you. So look at these older buildings and make an assessment as to whether they're really appropriate for the time, whether they're going to be useful for the present into the future. 
Um, buildings change all the time. If you look at a photograph that's 50 years old, you'll be very, very surprised, as you would be if you were in London, because the building stock changes over almost 100% within about 50 to 70 years. There are very, very few remnants of old London in central, central London. Cities are changing organisms. You don't see it because the change happens somewhat slowly, but they, they are. That change and renewal is something that uh, uh, is really uh, an adjunct of a healthy economic cycle for the city. If you have a city that's simply an aspect that remains with all of its wonderful buildings, they're no longer living cities in that sense. So I think looking at buildings in a different way, seeing their efficacy, and trying to understand that they're needing to promote a larger goal, which is the, the, uh, to the benefit of the people of the city. You're, you here are designers and people involved in design. You need to understand the cities are, are there to be used. They're there to provide uh, shelter, but also to give people a sense of aspiration to move forward. They need to make them feel safe and provide social spaces that promote the exchange of ideas between people. If they don't do that, then I think they should be considered not to exist in the city proper unless they can be re-inhabited in a different way. One of the, some of the greatest buildings in London are old factories and energy centers that have been converted into museums. But you really need to make a different, understand cities not as a series of objects, but as places where people coalesce together, share ideas. And cities depend, you're competing with other cities. Your lifeblood is the people in them and the ability of the buildings and the architecture and the urban spaces to allow for that sharing. Any other? That's a lovely po polemic, isn't it? Uh, but I just uh, get the other side of the room first? We'll go back and forth, back and forth. Is this illustrating a political bent here? It, it is. Left I'm, and I'm right, or that doesn't happen in Canada? About 10 minutes, so, uh, so take your time. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Is the uh, uh, elevator system or any of the other mechanical and electrical systems uh, impacted design-wise by the, the wooden uh, no, structure? No, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll just repeat what I heard from uh, Michael Ramage from Cambridge University, is that the lift, uh, the lift people actually prefer not to have concrete. <laughs> they prefer the timber because it more, it's somewhat more pliant, um, which I don't quite understand, but apparently that's so. It, sorry, it's somewhat more pliant. That if you pour something in concrete and it's wrong, it's, it's wrong forever. That was one of the things that he mentioned, but more so that they're happy to have the, core, the cores if they're made of timber, properly all made of timber. And they're somewhat stable. They can be made more accurately in the first instance. The accuracy of these timber panels is phenomenal. In Tret, the steel had to be recut because the assembly of the panels were so accurate so you have to understand that this is not like, you know, this isn't stuff you get at Canadian Tire. This stuff is this really high uh, precision material. And it has to be because it needs to be stacked extraordinarily accurately. Any carpenters here? I used to be a carpenter. And you get it wrong by just a few millimeters and stack it over 10 stories, you're off by a lot. So the precision's important. One of the other things we didn't mention was fire, but I'll mention that subsequently after all this questions. Come up and see the models too. You know, sitting is bad for your health. <laughs> and texting is even worse. So, because, okay. Hi, I, I want to follow up on the comment that you made at the tail end of the last question, or the previous question, which was um, about these tall buildings that you're doing and the public realm. You, in, in one of your slides, you talked about London and the genius of London's cafes and the cafe society. And that illustration showed w what I interpreted to be public realm up in the, up in the tower. Um, this city is completely fixated with building residential density in the downtown core. And one of the things that seems horribly unthought about, not calculated at, in, in any way, shape, or form, is the notion of 
amenity, mixed use, et cetera. So what is your strategy, if there is one there, about taking people off the street through a private realm to some kind of public realm up in the sky? Okay. So the first thing that should be understood is that we're involved with a company called The Collective, and they're building micro-housing, basically, for urban individuals in city centers. London, they have one that's just got planning. We're, we're involved with that. And then one a little further out. And the notion there is that there are young professionals who've just come out of university, who have lots of ideas and talent, and really like spaces as they would have them in their university settings, in dorms where you have lots of sharing going on. So in these places, there's the potential of sharing kitchen spaces, of having a, a shared uh, central space that's uh, very public and sort of semi-public, let's say. Of course, they'd be carded um, for security, but the security is really trying to invite uh, people into the building. Um, as guests, so they're sort of guest halls. I think in Toronto there still are, usually on the ground floor here, there are large uh, public spaces that where people can come down their elevators and meet guests and friends and go have a little dinner, and it used to be the case. Maybe it's not anymore. Certainly in, in Montreal it was very common because of the sociability of the spaces. You're talking about the upper gardens as well. Well, those are part of this notion that we create this shared public spaces. What we're finding in the UK is that the marketplace really is women, young women who want to feel secure in the setting, who also want to be associated with this sort of green, new emerging green technology, and also young professional males. And what we're hoping is that these buildings will become sort of hives of new ideas, that all these professionals will cross uh, cross-breed their ideas so that we get some kind of a new uh, 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 emerging uh, technologies that rise from it, new ideas of how to live and uh, sharing of uh, you know, the advantage of their knowledge. And that does happen in cities in London. People really do go and have a coffee or a beer and they talk about what they do as a speciality and then they try to understand what the other people are doing as their speciality and then they think, well, is there any connection we can make a business out of this? because I can sort of see there's a crossover, there's a synergy that's potential. And that was the notion of that building. For Brexit, we need new ideas. The world is a, a land of new ideas, not of objects and things any longer. So that was really the impetus of the tower, bring new people in who are you know, enervated by new technology. I hope that answers, it may not answer. But I do agree with you in Toronto, planning is a, is a concern that you should be having. And I think making more public spaces um, available uh, would be terrific, particularly on the waterfront. Yeah. We have time for uh, two more questions. So uh, if we want to just kind of. I was too early. One more. All right. Where, which one goes? Awesome. Ladies, first. Ladies first. Ladies first. Ladies <laughs> first. Hi. Thank you for the great talk. And I like the idea of um, using Tender as a building innovation. But what are some challenges that you see for us to promote using Tender? instead of concrete or steel? Um, well, the first thing is, I think it was mentioned uh, earlier that uh, the industry has to grow uh, of its own because the type of engineers, the engineering that's taught in schools neg ne uh, neglects timber, this type of timber, it's not taught. And also there are very few contractors, very likely, that, that are knowledgeable in this type of material. In Nova Scotia, they're building quite a lot of them, I've heard. And there okay. they can build them at uh, 10, there are six to eight stories. The code allows them to do this. The code in Ontario has been changed very recently to allow this type of construction at, at lower heights. Um, but the industry has to, there has to be a new industry growing. Think of Tesla. It doesn't use gas. It's okay. using the roads, mm -hmm. but it's a new invention. And it's uh, something that is going to have to be transformative, but also builds from knowledge, new knowledge that's created. And this is why universities, associating ourselves with the university is critical, because we're just at this nascent stage where new information needs to be provided to move us forward. For the taller tower in, in Holland, what we need to do in order to reinforce, we understand, we need to actually put cables potentially through the timbers on the lower levels, because there's a tension and compression uh, calculation that seems to require extra stiffness. 
And that's something that's been done in New Zealand and in Australia, mm -hmm. commonplace there, and lovely that we have the inter World Wide Web because we can communicate with these people and share information directly. Mm -hmm. It's like a little club now. There are about 150 people. Mr. Michael Green was one of the you know, fantastic promoters of this type of technology as well. Um, but it's a, a, a small group now who are trying to promote it. And our intention is trying to get younger people interested in it so that it becomes a new type of technology, a new industry of its own. Oh, okay. We're not um, going to be able to change people who only build out of concrete to people who only build out of timber or want to. OK. It's one more how, question. That's not how it works. Yeah. OK. You really have time for there. more. So. Okay. And I'll come back to you. OK. Or so you come over. I'm a conflicted generalist. So this presentation conflicted overarching of cars okay. and towers and cities yes. and energy is just firing synapses all Great. over the place. So it's wonderful. Does everyone else feel that way? <laughs> Hands up. <laughs> When I'm not a conflicted generalist, I'm a facade specialist with okay. WSP. Great. Uh, and I, I want to pick WSP. up on one. Yep. Yeah, I want to pick up on one point. You mentioned the exterior exoskeleton, essentially, of right. this building providing some shade. Um, generally, again, very generally, facades tend to obscure the structure or at least protect it from the elements. How how have you managed that interaction of structure and interior space and weathering and facade integration and thermal bridging. I mean, wood is a Great. terrific, Great. terrific okay, so component. Thermal, thermal performance, yeah. timber is quite good. Yeah. First, there is a problem of wanting to express the timber externally. We've been talking with AXO Nobel about what we can do. It's likely that we're going to have to put some kind of a forward panel that's timber-ish that sits, that allows to insulate the panel. The timber changes. This material changes with uh, water ingress. Yeah. So we can't sort of have the rain hitting one side of the building and yeah. it's swelling. Exactly. So there are these kinds of challenges that are ongoing. But the benefits, but also I think the, the uh, sort of proven technology to date, there are no sort of what they call in the UK showstoppers. There's nothing that seems to be a challenge that's impossible to meet. Every material has its downside. Every material has its negative. So we kind of see there's generally very great positives with, mis with this material. It can create a new industry, and it can broaden the use of different materials. In Toronto, quite astonishing, 80, 81% of the material is here is used concrete, which is, you know, they don't even do that in New York. So, you know, you have a, a marketplace that, that has the advantage of, of uh, accepting something new and different that, that can challenge and be provocative. One of the other things that should be mentioned is that they're also looking at glass because celluloid in China and Russia, the film stock that was used for films, you probably don't even know what film is, most of you guys, <laughs> but it was made from cellulose. They used to cut the tree down and the byproduct was celluloid. And now, of course, there are researchers trying to uh, encapsulate uh, timber, but also to use that formulation to create glass. So, you know, you can imagine in 20 or 30 years, the whole building will be made of timber, not just the external exoskeleton, but the glass itself. And those could lead to how to protect the timber as well, potentially. We're very early, early stage of this development. But if you have any interest, just come by, give me your card if you have interest or have any other connections. And I see somebody here from RWDI right there. Hi. Okay, what was your question? You have to do it quickly, though. Okay, okay. Thanks for the answer. Um, what are some challenges that concrete or steel, like other materials, have over timber? And is it possible for combining use of timber, concrete, and steel in one okay, building? Okay, I'll do that really quickly. I did, went to a talk at the AIA convention about a year ago. The mm -hmm. people in the concrete industry want to reduce the amount of energy that they're using. Mm -hmm. So they've made great strides in doing that. Okay. They don't necessarily talk about CO2, but they have an interest in, because as oil prices go up, they don't want to use, you know, that it digs into their profits. But fundamentally, a lot of these uh, technologies are 3,000 years old. Concrete was invented by the Greeks, somewhat perfected by the, by the Romans. In India, they created iron. The type of iron that we see now was created in India. The Vikings created a, a, a better forms of steel, I think it was chromium steel, and then the Germans reinvented it in the 20th century. So these are materials that are ancient. 
and they have their own building industry that's equally as ancient because the material itself tends to create a, a normative platform from which you need to understand how to build. There's stages of building and you not need the concrete to cure, you need to make formwork. You, so the industry is 2,000 years old. How different is it from the Romans? So this material, using digital technology and its cutting and its performance and its laminating and assembly is, the, is a new way forward. It's, it will transform the way that we see a building buildings. It will make them much more cost effective, no doubt, because it will be made on an assembly line pattern. And uh, it has the benefits of being CO2 less and uh, sequestering all that wonderful CO2 that we're going to have a problem with as the population increases. You have to, population growth apparently is not going to, it's going to plateau after about 2050. And the reason given is that women will be educated. The education of women is part of the, the solution for population growth and globally, I've understood. So, okay. you know, we, ha okay. we have to look to the future and what's to the benefit of, of people at large and to the cities. How do we want to live in our lovely cities? Uh, I gotta cut it off here, sorry. Okay, <laughs> you, can, you can ask me later. Absolutely. Thank you very much Kevin. for inviting me. All right. <laughs>